Hello folks, welcome back to Tesla craziness. Uh, remember the last video I said to you that when I'd be um, working on the last few things for the Model 3 drive unit that it would probably only take a few days? Uh-uh, took a week. Because Elon decided in his infinite wisdom to give me a bad hair day with his HV derived power supply. Yes. See, Elon's the kind of guy that he's not a one power supply sort of a board. Who knew? We have three. See, three, model three. So, anyway, uh, the HV derived one is based on a Viper 16 chip, which is one I've used way back in the day. And uh, it's quite a good chip. It's actually uh, used in things like um, oh like plug pack 5 volt power supplies and 12 volt power supplies it's a general offline power supply chip and but they use it in this case uh, for providing a low voltage um, supply of around 18 volts uh, derived from the high voltage 360 volts nominally um, Starts up at about 70 volts, I'd recalled from previous experimentation. Um, turns out running it for any length of time at that kind of a voltage is a real bad idea. So thanks for that little surprise, Elon. Uh, but the good news is we are running in closed loop throttle control mode. So tuning was a little bit of a story as well because I haven't done um, FOC tuning in years now and there's a lot of differences in the FOC firmware because uh, it's came along quite a bit. So I'm going to stop walking around like some kind of a moron and uh, we'll start showing you uh, what we've got going on here for you, starting with an uber boring exploratory mission of that high voltage power supply. I warned you, it's boring. So before we uh, start talking about the little uh, power supply problem that we had here on the inverter earlier in the week, I want to just say thank you very much indeed to the person that donated this connector. Uh, for the high voltage uh, to me. Uh, not only did that person donate it free of charge, but sent it to me by a very fast courier from around half a planet away. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, I won't mention any names, but you know who you are. Alrighty, let's get rid of this connector here. We don't need it at the minute. So. Let's have a little uh, talk about what happened here. So this section of the board here, so this little transformer, diodes, caps, some little passives and so on here, uh, constitutes a power supply um, that generates approximately 18 to 18 and a half volts DC here on this uh, secondary side. And that's derived from the high voltage, so the nominally 360 volts DC, uh, that comes in from the high voltage battery. Now, I'm not 100% sure about this, but to the best of my investigations, uh, this power supply does three things. So three for the model, three. First thing that it does is it provides the isolated uh, or the, I guess the high voltage side power supply to this guy here, which is our uh, high voltage measuring circuit. So this, these two chips here and some of these passives uh, basically measure whatever the high voltage DC that we apply and send a corresponding zero 
uh, to 3.3 volt signal to our microcontroller so that it may measure the high voltage voltage. The second thing uh, that it does is it provides power to the low side gate drivers in the event of a loss of the primary power supply here which is derived from the, the 12 volts uh, low voltage side. And the third thing that it does is it provides power to the high voltage uh, discharge circuit. And that's comprised of all of these resistors here in the middle of the board. Uh, MOSFET, um, little NPN part here and a few more passives. Now this is responsible for bleeding off the high voltage from the um, capacitor that's in underneath the board here um, when we no longer want to have high vo voltage here. Now this isn't controlled, at least as far as I can tell, by the micro. This is controlled by the presence absence of the high voltage interlock uh, current loop. So when the high voltage interlock current loop is not present, you'll normally a MOSFET here, which completes the circuit and connects this resistor bank uh, basically across the high voltage terminals and tries to bleed off any voltage uh, that may be present in the capacitors. Now, when the high voltage interlock is present, or the high voltage interlock current loop is present, uh, this MOSFET is turned off and that discharging resistor is disconnected. Now, <clears throat> in order to do that, obviously we need a little low voltage supply and that's derived again from our uh, Viper 16 um, based power supply here. So as you'll see here, I've removed this part. This is the Viper 16 chip, uh, which is what does all the heavy lifting. So what happened? Well, I was tuning away here uh, with the setup um, that you'll see, and I had about 100 volts DC uh, connected to my HV. I did not have any um, high voltage interlock loop current present, nor had I lifted a leg on this little guy here. So, I was tuning for about an hour and stopped the motor and I noticed it was a kind of a buzzing sound emanating from this part of the um, PCB. And I also noticed that the high voltage measurement on the web interface uh, was becoming intermittent. And then there was a tiny little wisp of smoke from somewhere around here. And the buzzing stopped. I thought, oh well, it's fixed. <laughs> so anyway, disconnected the HV and got up on the bench and did some investigation. So, so far, uh, this is what I have discovered that actually occurred. Uh, the first thing was that this MOSFET was completely shorted. So, gate source drain all completely shorted together. This had in turn fed some of the 100 volts into the little NPN transistor here, which is used to control the gate of the MOSFET. That had blown this part and had then put a short circuit on the secondary side of the uh, Viper 16 power supply. That had then blown the um, rectifier diode on the secondary side, um, short circuit. The, vi the v Viper chip um, has two power supplies in it. One is its own built-in current source uh, that derives a startup supply from the high voltage. 
And it's, not, it's normally then when the power supply starts up, it can take some of its own, uh, it can take its, its, its own power supply from the secondary side. So when this diode failed, the Viper got some very nasty power fed back into it. Pin 5, I think, is the VDD pin. And that blew it. Pop. So the Viper chip was now shorted, which in turn placed a short between the high voltage positive through the primary winding of the transformer into the Viper chip and to the ground of our high voltage. So a little wisp of smoke was the Viper chip saying goodbye uh, when the HV um, went into it. So, um, the transformer seems fine. There's no shorts or um, open circuits in it. Um, obviously the voltage measuring and low side drivers and um, HVIL and all that seems perfectly fine. I just have a little wire soldered on here and as you will see I've been just feeding um, 18 volts um, into this um, with respect to HV ground. So that's where we, uh, we lost a few days on this one. The chip that they use here is the Viper A16, which is the automotive grade. Naturally, that's on obtainium. So I have ordered some ordinary Viper 16s, so we'll have to slum it back in old commercial temperature spec. So hopefully, uh, we get a Viper 16 in here. I have a new diode in here. I have a little jumper link here from HV Pause, because uh, I was doing some experiments on here. Uh, I'm not quite sure how they bring HV pause into the transformer. It's a little bit weird, kind of typically Tesla. Anyway, uh, so that's the little adventure that we had here. But the good news is the destruction was uh, limited to this arena. So, what actually caused it? Well, best as I can figure out, um, it's kind of 50% me being a moron and 50% kind of um, not the best, shall we say, hardware design cho choices here. So the me being a moron is pretty straightforward. We were dissipating heat in this area of the PCB here, uh, even with only 100 volts uh, going in. By not having the high, the high voltage interlock loop, it meant this MOSFET was turned on, so it was conducting. Uh, some of that heat probably soaked through some of the pads here and gave this guy a bad hair day. He then blew, which blew the little NPN, which then blew the rectifier diode, which then caused our wisp of smoke from the Viper 16. It would have been, you know, quite easy to not have that failure mechanism in there but then again I suppose it's very easy for me sitting here in retrospect to say well oh you know should have designed it better and I'm not quite saying that because obviously what I was doing here was completely outside of the uh, normal use case for this um, inverter so bit of a lesson learned there folks anyway I'm not 100% sure, you know, about the failure uh, graph or whatever you want to call it, like, or the failure prog progression here. Uh, but whatever it is, um, at least we've found it here and its, um, its destruction was reasonably limited. So, hopefully in the next episode we'll have this patched up. Okay, so I'll try and walk you through our setup here at the minute just so you can see what's going on before we do any running. Um, so what we have is our model 3 drive unit uh, with the inverter um, sitting on top of it just with these um, I've just got these little six square 
extension cables uh, just for the three phases, just coming off the bus bars here and going on to the ones on the motor. Um, the reason to have the inverter up here uh, rather than just bolted on is that it lets me measure things and examine things as we're running the motor and learning how the various aspects uh, behave here. So <clears throat> probably the most important thing on here is going to be the mod board. So let me, let me get you in here and show you what we've got here. So what we've got is in place of the TI C2000, we've our little um, version one mod, mod board. And this is a little Wi-Fi module here that's plugged into the, um, oh, it's plugged into the JTAG uh, connector so that I can have Wi-Fi access uh, for doing things like programming and changing parameters in the STM32. Now, this is not required at all uh, to run. We don't need it here. So I can literally just unplug that, take it away and we'll still be able to run our uh, motor so it's not required at all it's just for initial setups and uh, tuning so when we come to put our inverter back on to the drive unit basically that's it we'll have our mod board on there and that'll be that so um the good news in terms of the whole Wi-Fi module and things like that is there have been some really good developments going on around that. And we now have a, a functional CAN boot loader uh, for the Open Inverter project and the STM32. So we can do our software updates over CAN. Uh, Dave's been working on a CAN control tool. Um, so it lets you do everything that the Wi-Fi can do uh, just over can and I believe that someone on the open inverter forum is also working on a um, a can to Wi-Fi bridge so you can have your Wi-Fi module like it doesn't have to be inside connected to it it can be anywhere on the can bus inside the car or anywhere that you might want it to be so these are all really uh, good the developments uh, that are going to help us along the way here. So, now you may be uh, wondering why I've got these connections here around this part of the board. And what they're doing at the minute is they're supplying an auxiliary 18 volts uh, supply. And I will explain that on the bench in a little bit more detail why we actually have that. In short, the reason it's here is we have a failed component here. And I'm just waiting for a replacement to arrive. Uh, but again, once that component's back on here, there'll be no need for any of this wiring nonsense here. And uh, pretty much we will be sealing in our little mod board uh, just with some uh, UV curing um, solder mask and that'll be going back on the inverter and going in the Moscow. So exciting times. Um, so other, uh, that's it really. Uh, the only other thing probably worth mentioning is that the wiring harness to all this kind of low voltage harness that you see here and a bit of wiring mess on the floor. Um, that is one I put together myself, but it is done as per Tesla's uh, wiring diagram. So if you did get a, you know, it's the very same as the one you would get off a Model 3. So uh, the only hardware checks that I've left to do for our mod board is to check the LIN communication with the oil pump. So I'm going to cobble together a crude little bit of code uh, for that um, fairly soon uh, just to test the, ha the hardware um, and then we'll have like the whole reverse engineering saga that we'll have to do for um, 
communicating with the oil pump, but the good news is we do know what the control chip is and we have the data sheet for it, so that's going to help a lot. But just to make sure the hardware works and I haven't screwed up somewhere else, um, I am going to have to test that before we can button this thing up. So, uh, let's see what else we have here. So we just got a throttle pedal. This is a Tesla Model 3 throttle pedal um, at the minute. Uh, it doesn't have to be. That's again another one of the advantages of the open inverter system. You can use any you know, Hall Effect 0 to 5 volt uh, throttle pedal that you wish. Uh, I just have the Tesla one here because I was using it um, just for the can experimentation that I was doing with the OEM uh, control scheme. So, let's see what else we have here then. So let's come over this way because this is one I do want to kind of focus on a little bit. So obviously in order to run, we need a source of... Um, quote unquote high voltage uh, for I guess supplying you know traction power to our drive unit so in order to do that here what I have uh, is I have a section from the um, Ampera battery uh, that we took out of the Panzer following our famous BMS fire and that and its friends have been out in the rain now for the last few months just chilling out um, to get themselves limbered up for their next project. But in the meantime, I've brought this one in uh, to supply us with approximately 99 to 100 volts of high voltage. Now, when we're doing this kind of experimentation, it's inevitable that we're going to have a problem uh, in the inverter and the problems like that are going to lead to it attempting to draw way too much current uh, from the high voltage source. So unfortunately what I see a lot of folks doing is they think you know oh well you know this is potentially dangerous so what I should do is, is I should put a fuse or a circuit breaker in here um, in order to protect the inverter. And that's a really good idea. And you'll see that I have this scary thing here because every time this thing pops, I jump the height of myself, um, which you will probably see happen because it tends to pop a bit. This is a DC, just a cheap DC 32 amp uh, circuit breaker. And this is the positive feed wire to our inverter HV. The negative is just connected straight to the battery negative post. But we're not just running through a circuit breaker into the inverter because if we did that, the in this inverter in particular would be long since dead. So this is, as I say, the bit that I've, I've tried to explain in the, in the past. I don't think I've really succeeded. I'll try again here, uh, but no guarantee that it's going to be successful. So what I have here is this thing. And all this thing is, is a heating element. Um, this one is actually from an injection molding machi machine. Um, it's nominally rated at 230 volts and about 4 kilowatts, about 20 ohms, I think, of uh, resistance. Either 10 or 20 ohms, I forget which. But um, it can be any kind of a heating element, like a cooker, um, electric cooker, Electric cooker oven elements are a really good uh, choice here uh, when we're doing this sort of a thing. And what we're simply doing here is we're coming off the battery positive, coming down to this wire here, we're going into one side of the heating element, we're coming out of the other side. So this heating element, as long as we have the battery hooked up, is always in circuit. What we then do is we take our fuse or a circuit breaker or whatever kind of device that we might like to use and we just wire that in parallel 
with our heating element. And the idea is here, when we're doing our initial experiments, the heating element will limit the current from the battery. It won't stop the current flowing, but it will limit it and stop it from climbing up into oblivion. But that's only one of the things that it's going to do for us. When we get to the point that we think, oh yeah, this is okay, you know, this is kind of working, we can close that circuit breaker and bypass the heating element. So now we have the battery connected to the inverter HV via the circuit breaker. The electricity from the battery, when it gets to this point here, can either take a super low resistance path through the circuit breaker or a pain in the butt high resistance path through the heating element. So naturally, it's going to take the path of least resistance and go through the circuit breaker. And as long as we don't do something stupid <laughs> and exceed the rating of our circuit breaker, everything's just fine. Now, obviously we're tuning and we're experimenting and we're learning and we kind of don't know what we're doing, as I tend to not. Um, so inevitably, I'm going to hit that throttle a little bit too fast or I'll have a parameter wrong or something and it'll try and draw way more current than our fuse or circuit breaker will allow and that's going to trip off. However, when it trips off, the current still has a path both to and from the battery via the heating element and that's vital. Because if I'm spinning this motor and I don't have the heating element, and this breaker trips, there's energy in here that has nowhere to go, and the voltage is just going to hit sky high, and it's going to blow those lovely, sexy Elon silicon carbide MOSFETs to hell and gone before you can even blink. However, a piece of junk heating element or a bit of an electric cooker ring or anything at all that has a little bit of resistance in it will save you from that problem. So this is what we have going on here. So I'm going to demonstrate that to you now. So <clears throat> let's take uh, the camera over here a little bit. So right now you should be able to see, let me get you seeing things here, yeah, there you go, okay. So you can see the um, throttle pedal and our flanges and we've got a circuit breaker off. So when I press the throttle now, so the motor turns and then it stops, so it kind of gives a little turn like that. If I go really gently on the throttle I can get it to spin a bit. So what's happening there is, the circuit breaker is turned off. So the current is being limited by the heating element. So if I just floor the throttle, it's just going to sit there doing that. Because every time the inverter tries to draw current, the heating element limits it, in this case to 6, six amps DC. Now. When I'm getting a little more confident and I think, you know, okay, I might have that tune where I need it to be, I can go ahead and close my circuit breaker. Now when I give my throttle a little blip, the motor spins away perfectly happily. So that's just um, the way that I tend to do these things in order to um, obviously to be safe in terms of what I'm doing with the battery and the wiring and all that which is primarily what the fuse is for but it's really the heating element here is the thing that's going to protect my expensive inverter so hope that makes sense folks um, and anyone that's doing this kind of work you know any kind of inverters or high voltages and you know this doesn't have to be a hundred volts this could be two 12 volt car batteries hooked up in series and it'll still 
if you just have a breaker or a fuse in there and you're unfortunate enough to have that fail, you're pretty much guaranteed to destroy your inverter. But with a couple of simple little setup like this, um, you know, we can spin away, get the full uh, benefit, and if we do have a trip, Oh, you're going to want me to trip it, aren't you? I hate it when this thing trips. Now it won't trip. Watch this. No! Ah! 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 I hate it when that thing trips. Ah! Okay. So we tripped it. But if we now press our little throttle again... Oh, of course the inverter has shut down because of the spike that's probably occurred. Let's uh, do a little reset here. Um, reset my 12 volt supply. Be funny now if it had destroyed the inverter, wouldn't it? After me giving that tedious uh, lecture like that. So let's see. We want to send start signal. So I'll turn that one off. So start signal on. I would send forward signal. Are we sending a forward signal? I think we are. And there we go. No dead inverter, folks. And because the breaker is off, obviously, here in this case now, um, we're limiting current again. So there you have it. <laughs> I had to change my underpants. Um, so um yeah so you can trip a breaker blow a fuse perfectly safely um not cause any uh damage um as long as you've got a resistance element here in parallel with it so there you have it all right let's see if we can uh do a little bit of a run here so we're in forward mode um, which is just arbitrary at the minute, but forward mode has the drive shaft cups turning towards me, which I guess would be reverse in the normal Tesla setup. Give her a little zip of the throttle. So we've got some very slow ramps on here at the minute, just because we don't want anything shaking itself apart while I have the inverter up here but we can um, we can run away there and regen uh, in forward so let's switch to reverse I'm just doing that from savvy can here just sending a super simple can message so that should be the reverse message. So that should have us going, um, the drive shaft cups turning away from me. Yeah, there we go. That would be forward, I guess, in the normal uh, Tesla. Ooh, that, bah, that circuit breaker. Gah! <laughs> That thing gets me every time I jump the height of myself because I think the inverter's, <laughs> the inverter's blown. But, as you can see, the inverter is not blown because we have our heating element in there. So, let's reset it. It just heats up. It's only a 30 amp breaker, so I'm being very, um, I've been very, uh, ha. <laughs> oh, God, it's a killer. Um, I've been very conservative with it, um, just as we're still only kind of really getting into the, the tuning here. Well, there it is, uh, forward and reverse. Uh, with our 100 volt uh, battery and throttle control. Okay, so for this run, we have the oil pump turned on now. Uh, I don't normally run it here just when I'm doing short um, 
spins because the noise of it tends to distract me from things I might need to be paying attention to. But uh, it's running now at full speed here. So we'll just check with our current limiter in place. Yeah, our motor wants to spin. So we close our scary circuit breaker and give her a little spin. So that's with oil circulation now. So we can, you know, stay running for as long as we like really there now. So that's forward uh, with oil circulation on and just for completeness sake um, I will change to I guess reverse or whichever just to change direction I guess So there we go with oil circulation on. Now at the minute it's worth noting as well that we don't have LIN uh, communication going on with the, that blasted circuit breaker. We don't have LIN communication going on uh, with the oil pump um, at this stage um because so it's running at full at full speed yeah i figured i'd done that our inverter is tripped out as well okay well folks that is it for this video thought we would finish up with a little bit of a look at the old moscow waiting here patiently with her drive shafts pulled out and uh we will be seeing you in the next semi exciting episode hopefully when we have the new viper chip fitted and uh, we will start doing some um muskvo muskvoing so until then folks as always do yourselves a favor give this video a thumbs down unsubscribe from this stupid channel do not support me on Patreon or PayPal or any other way because then you just encourage me to do more of these kind of stupid videos and stupid car projects that nobody wants to see. So, do though have a look at the links for the open inverter forum and things like that. And uh, so that's it. And until next time. Happy Viper Chip Replacement.